both. Well, since this is the first talk, I will try not to tire you too much so that you still have some energy left for the, the next, uh, the next uh, three. Um, yeah, Avi was asking me to say some uh, general things uh, about um, whatever the problems in uh, mathematical computer science and um, whatever go whatever is, is going on there now I mean personally what what seems like is that whatever the kind of mathematics you are doing you can somehow give it a little twist so that it gets I mean you start getting points of contact with uh, uh, things that interest people in uh, mathematical computer science and eventually get funded for it so basically uh, what I'm going to talk about is one of the illustrations of this, but I'm sure there are many more. So, um, really, the the main um, the the key focus of this talk will be around um, um, say problems of uh, AK distribution for multiplicative groups. I don't know if you can if you can read it. Definitely, you should ask questions if you have questions. <coughs> and I will try to answer them if I can. Icky distribution of multiplicative groups, and there will be a number of problems. Avi was ask, was was telling me, well, just don't. Don't just uh, list uh, theorems, but try to say what are uh, the, the problems, uh, the remaining problems or interesting problems or questions uh, that, that people maybe can look at. And there will be various kinds of problems. Uh, I don't think any of these problems is, is easy, otherwise it wouldn't be a problem. But uh, in any case, there will be questions that definitely require a new ID that somehow will go together with really a breakthrough on the level of methods. There also will be questions uh, that perhaps can be uh, advanced to some extent by reorganizing proofs, by making proofs more efficient. And then finally, there, there will be some things which are at the really extreme edge where the, the progress is really a computational matter, and say where there is a difference between point 0.8 and point 0.81 and things like that, really a completely different kind of, of map, um, which I have rarely been, been involved with, but anyway, I will tell you uh, what, we know how what we know to do and what has to be done. And, um, one of the things I learned is that somehow, um, even that you have a rather good, I mean, not only uh, effective, but even efficient technique to, uh, to do something before you can really bring it in a computational range. It's, it's a very non-trivial thing, even with, with good estimates. Before somehow you can match what you can prove, say, for sufficiently large values and what you um, can verify numerically with the computer to make these things match, it's not, it's not an easy thing. So anyway, there are basically uh, three things I will discuss, which is Gaussian estimates. And also estimates for incomplete sums. I mean, <coughs> basically, in this ball game. Then slightly more general, uh, slightly more general than go sums, but still much less general than looking at general uh, veil type sums are uh, Mordell exponential sums. And then something which is uh, really close to these Mordell sums and which 
uh, kind of uh, fits the um, general philosophy is that certain questions can really lead to quite different uh, to, to aspects uh, which are, say, to, to developments which can have quite different flavors. Uh, this is something I want to illustrate with something I had been looking at last year, which is, an, uh, which is kind of an, an, an interesting and rather amazing uh, story, but I will not tell you that here, uh, which are some developments around a problem in coding theory, which is known as the uh, goretzky clapper decimation problem. So the basic problem for Gaussians is, well, one basic problem. Uh, if we go qualitatively, so we don't really look for the, the best possible estimates, but just some estimate. The uh, problem of, of equidistribution is the following question. Assume that we are looking at a subgroup H of the multiplicative group of a field. What do we have to assume about the size of H to have uniform distribution? So in other words, what we want is an estimate on the exponential sum So I say we'll keep it qualitative, so we don't really look at very good estimates, just an, uh, a non-trivial estimate in the sense that the exponential sum is little of h. So there is a conjecture by uh, Montgomery, Vaughan, and Woolley, which is worth what it is worth, which is extremely strong and tells you that uh, this holds provided that's a conjecture. Since I have to distinguish between conjectures, prob uh, theorems, and problems, I'll try to be uh, quite consistent from the beginning. So this is a conjecture which is very far from, uh, from being proven at this point, if it is true altogether. So what they conjecture is that as soon as you have the weakest imaginable condition, namely that the size of H divided by the logarithm of p goes to infinity, then you should have this equidistribution. Now, believe it or not, I mean, this is an other matter. There are certain potential obstructions to this conjecture. In fact, Konyagin told me one uh, last year, but uh, it's with a big question mark because somehow contraexamples depend on, uh, say, certain values of cyclotomic polynomials being prime or not. So one could believe it, not believe it. In any case, assume that uh, you would believe in whatever the potential counterexamples to that. Uh, it should be true. I mean, it should look like a reasonable conjecture, provided you replace the logarithm of p maybe by the logarithm of p times the double logarithm of p or something like that. Uh, still, um, it would not be sufficient to ensure, for instance, equidistribution if you're looking at partial orbits instead of full multiplicative groups. So one could perhaps try to come up with a conjecture which is safe from all points of view, uh, which I, I really would be surprised, surprised if it would not be true, uh, namely assuming that uh, instead of saying h is large compared with the logarithm of p, let's just assume that h is not of polylogarithmic size. So let's do, let's do the following. Let's take log of h over log log p. Um, goes to infinity. Now, I said these things are completely out of reach, and the best result known at this point is the following.
uh, you have a key distribution if the logarithm, so I'm going to replace that by something which looks much weaker, but still it's a certain improvement, considerable improvement in fact on what was known. If log h over log p is bigger than c times log log p. So in other words, what you have in particular is any small power of p is going to do the job. And in fact, more precisely, you can give an estimate. You can give an estimate on the exponential sum. Uh, if we write h to be p at the power delta for, say, some specific delta positive that can depend on p, uh, then we would have a bound. So this is closely related, basically gives you the reason for that. So what we have is that the exponential sum is less than p at the power minus delta prime times h. Now the dependence between delta prime and delta is important because what we can get is delta prime to be 1 over the exponent. Oh, uh, sorry, when I wrote c here, this is for a specific sufficiently large constant, right? But I will not be too precise through this talk. So, um, but it's not any c. The c there should be sufficiently large. So what we have is a dependence of delta prime on delta, which is of the form 1 over the exponent of, uh, say, some constant divided by delta. So you see immediately, if you want to get something, you should have a delta prime, which is like the logarithm. So delta should be like the double logarithm. So you have a saving there. You can get things. Basically, you can get things provided h is bigger than p at the power of some sufficiently large constant over log log p. And so problem one, try to improve on this. And this result comes. This is a typical product of um, arithmetic combinatorics. In fact, it comes from a much more general thing, which I will tell you in a moment. And that seems to be the limit of this method. And any kind of improvement beyond that will really require a new idea, which will be a, re a real breakthrough. So if you want problems, if you can improve on that, I'll be very impressed. OK. No. What? What? Well, if I don't put if, if I don't put any kind of <laughs> specification, <laughs> so that is. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, well, there 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 is a. Um, I should have said this from the beginning. I have a paper uh, which is in fact uh, the proceedings of the European uh, Congress of Mathematics, Amsterdam. So I'll be happy to distribute that paper, which contains all the references and much more of what, what I'm saying here. This will somehow speed up the matter because I don't want to waste time giving all the whatever, all the credits. And this is not the point. I want to focus on the mathematics, not on the credits. Now, as I said, this comes from something which is much more general and which is, if you want, the multilinear generalization of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Well, you see, there is something which is completely trivial. But still, it's one of the main inequalities which is used in mathematics. It is, in particular, in mathematical computer science. It is called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And it has various applications. Um, and often, it gives you the best possible results. In any case, the form I'm interested in is the following thing. You take EP, uh, say, XY. EP is always the exponent. I should have said that perhaps for those who are EP or EQ, X is E to pi I X over Q. Okay. So uh, if I take X and Y in general sets A and B, uh, what you have is that this thing is less than square root of p times square root of a times b. In other words, you get a non-trivial bound provided a b 
is bigger than p at the power 1 plus epsilon. Or, st or simply, in general, provided a, b is, is much larger than p, particularly if a, b is larger than p at the power 1 plus epsilon. <laughs> now, what you could ask, and this is something that looks like an absolutely fundamental thing, what if we put three variables here? So if we put x, y, z, we take x in a, y in b, z in c. Uh, yeah, so a and b are completely general here, right? So a and b, this is important, a and b. Although these results are for multiplicative groups, really the principles they are coming from are much more general and allow you to, to show things uh, which are of uh, a nature which is not a priori of involving any kind of specific uh, algebraic structures and has its own interest particular to the theory of extractors, but I, won't <coughs> I don't want to get into that here. So A and B are completely general subsets of FP. So it looks like a completely natural question. If you add one more set here, do you have the same result? X in A, Y in B, Z in C. Can you get a non-trivial bound if A, B, C is larger than P? So this is something which is absolutely non-trivial, at least to me. And, uh, that kind of result is the type which, as you can perhaps imagine, gives you, in particular, uh, these exponential sum bounds. It's the following. Uh, if we take several sets, so I will raise this. Let me put that as an uh, underlying phenomenon here, which is another statement now of a completely general nature. If we take, say, a uh, certain number of sets, A1, AR, I'll tell you right away the, diffi the difficult case is R equals 3. If you can do R equals 3, you get the general case. So these are subsets, R is fixed, of uh, FP with the properties that, uh, let's say, the AIs are bigger than P to the epsilon, and the product of the AIs is bigger than P at the power 1 plus epsilon. Then you have, here I'll write it in a non-quantitative um, uh, form, you have that the multilinear exponential sum, so we take x1, etc., xr, with xi in ai, is going to be bounded by p minus delta, where delta depends on epsilon times the product of the set. So that is the kind of thing uh, which are underlying this phenomena. They came from arithmetic combinatorics and, um, uh, well, basically they give you in, in this form an optimal, an optimal result provided uh, you are willing to go here for epsilon. If epsilon goes to zero, then of course it becomes important how delta epsilon is going to depend on epsilon and uh, uh, things like that. Uh, in any case, the, um, the, 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 the kind of thing uh, which I was referring to that this type of inequalities uh, appear to uh, be connected to are questions of, uh, say, random extraction out of general sources, which just like by some coincidence turns out to be also a topic of interest in mathematical computer science because what it really tells you is that you can extract a random and in fact a very good random bit out of R sources for which the total entropy assignment is slightly above one. And that as a very general principle. I will not go into this direction but let me just say that this is not only a tool to <laughs> prove that but somehow that uh, by itself uh, is also a statement that has certain interest in things people have been looking at here in this, in this world. Now, um, a few comments. First of all, I have to go a little bit faster. Uh, one can raise the question, what is happening in, uh, well, what is happening with the, the problem to come back uh, on the key distribution, uh, the problem of simply understanding when the orbit of, of such a group, I mean, when such a group 
to some extent is dense. So we can go for something which is completely, well, I mean, which is a consequence, but which is definitely a weaker statement, which is density. What do I uh, mean by that? So density in the following sense that we want to have uh, the maximum of i over p going to zero where the maximum is taken over, say, all intervals i in 1p, which are such that uh, i intersection a h is empty uh, for some a in fp star. In other words, what you're looking for uh, is the maximal size of an interval which is not going to intersect some coset of your multiplicative group. This is, of course, much weaker because if you have, I mean, this is well known, if you have any exponential sum bound, then you can prove that this thing goes to zero. Now, to tell you what is the situation of this type of question, as I told you, for exponential sums, this is the best which one can do presently. And for this problem, this is also, I mean, for this problem, which is asking much less, here you ask some kind of density instead of uh, equidistribution. Well, for that problem, again, uh, this thing is still the best, the weakest known condition to, um, to conclude that kind of phenomenon. On the other hand, there are some strange results uh, which come from a different field. And presently, we don't really know how to combine these methods. Uh, the other field being ergodic theory. In particular, there is a theorem of Furstenberg, which tells you that if you take, say, H to be the group generated by 2 and 3, or uh, basically the, the, the group generated by any given set of numbers, which are not powers of a uh, group generated by uh, two integers, given integers, which are not powers of the same integer, then this thing is always true. And in fact, uh, well, there is now an argument which is completely effective, uh, which was developed by, uh, in, in a paper, in a joint paper with um, uh, Elon Lindenstrauss, uh, Philip Michel, and Askew Venkatesh, which makes it even quantitative and tells you that uh, you will have, if I look at, if, if so you, you're dealing mod p, it doesn't, in fact, the p doesn't even have to be prime for that result. You can get this ratio. So if I call this, I'll call this star here, you can get this star less than 1 over log, log, uh, let's put another one, log <laughs> p at the power c. No, I'm not joking here, but we tried very hard to, rem to get better than that. And I mean, I'll be impressed if somebody comes with an argument to improve on that. Before, there were absolutely no effective bounds because the first and back technique uh, was, was, well, I mean, not hardly constructed, let's put it like that. Now there are effective bounds, and it would be quite <coughs> interesting to understand uh, what, can do, what can be done better. And especially what would be interesting is to combine these methods, which are completely different, with the methods from, say, uh, additive combinator, with methods from combinatorial number theory, uh, arithmetic combinatorics I mentioned to you earlier. But time is going fast. So what do I call now um, one thing before, um, before leaving the go sums? Uh, what I should uh, say is that this theory is now reasonably well developed. In particular, um, there are results known in many other situations, say when you look at exponential sums mod q for q not being a prime. By the way, before this result, the best thing which was known was p to the power 1 quarter plus epsilon. 
This result was due to Konyagin and a consequence of variance of Stefanos methods, classical methods. Uh, I'll tell you one result here, which is the following. What is nice is that there is a total uniformity in the modulus, and this, for instance, has been important in some uh, joint work with uh, Alex Gambert and Peter Sarnak in the around the theory of uh, uh, expanders uh, in um, in group theory is the fact that you have this uniformity in the modulus. So this is a result which is completely uniform in the modulus. By the way, which proof is much more complicated, but not going on that. So that tells you the following, is that for all delta positive, there is a delta prime such that if we take any group H, it has to be a full group here, uh, in the multiplicative group of Z mod QZ, which is of size at least Q to the delta, then you have that the exponential sums EQ AX are going to be less than Q at the power minus delta prime uh, times H, where delta prime is only dependent on delta, does not depend on the modulus. As far as I know, in this generality, no results were known unless delta is bigger than a half, and which are trivial in this case. Uh, another direction is that this kind of exponential sum bounds, it's not only known for prime fields, but there is a completely analogous statement for general fields, non-prime fields, finite fields, with a condition which is at least qualitatively the best one can hope for. The problem is that with the arithmetic combinatorics, whether it's for Z mod QZ or whether it's in a, in a general field, uh, the underlying ring, it's no, it's not going to, well, I mean, uh, it's not FP, it's not a prime field, so the underlying ring has subrings, and this is a problem in this business. Especially when Q is a highly composite number, Z mod QZ has a lot of subrings, and this is what creates a problem to get a kind of thing. So um, I want to move on a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, if you put the size of H, then you can. Very good. I'm, I'm happy somebody is. So this would be the group generated by H. Very good. Uh, no, one cannot improve th this. Probably one absolutely fundamental problem is to do better than Wells inequality for general polynomials. Now, problem is that uh, Wells inequality breaks down, basically it doesn't break down, but it doesn't give anything if the degree is larger than the square root of the characteristic of the, of the P. Let's, let's just work with, with, with prime fields. So going beyond that is definitely an uh, absolutely challenging problem. I, want, I don't want to discuss it. But the good thing is that in computer, in problems of pseudo-randomness, the exponential sums are usually not of the most general type. And what happens is that you're going to have exponential sums which are of the form, say, xk1 plus xk2, etc. They look like uh, Go sums, except that instead of having one monomial, you have a sum of R monomials. So what we want really is an exponential sum bound on this under possibly the most general, you can put coefficients here, a1, a2, ar, under possibly the most general conditions on the exponents k, and perhaps the coefficients a. So what I discussed before is the case where r is equal to 1, and in this case, you can reformulate the thing about uh, groups in terms of the exponent. What you need to have is that kp minus 1 is going to be less, say, a sufficient condition, kp minus 1 less than p1 minus, uh, p to the power 1 minus epsilon, or more generally, if you want to have something uh, less than uh, something like uh, p divided by... Um, Uh, uh, log log p or something like that, right? So what I want to do now is um, see what one can do in the situation when r is more than 1. In fact, this is what I call Mordell because Mordell had looked at that and for a long time, in fact, Mordell's result was for uh, 
was basically the, the best estimate known until Weil, of course, gave his general, uh, gave a result which was much superior. Nevertheless, uh, what it turns out is that there are cases where one can estimate this thing in a certain way, in a certain non-trivial way, uh, cases where the Weil estimate does not apply. Now, uh, Mordell uh, bound is not quite good enough for many applications uh, in pseudo-randomness. I, I don't have the time to discuss here. What I'm referring here uh, basically are questions about joint distribution of certain so-called um, uh, pseudo-random number generators. Uh, for instance, the, the uh, RSA generators or bloom bloom Shoop or uh, pseudo <laughs> Uh, linear congruential generators, uh, things like that, where one naturally is brought to understanding the behavior of such exponential sums, but unfortunately the exponents k are not of the kind that you can apply, well, neither veil nor whatever was known uh, as uh, Mordell's bound. So uh, what can be done here? Well, if you want to be able at least to uh, link it with what I said before, uh, the least condition one should put uh, is ki p minus 1, say less than p1 minus epsilon for some epsilon. Because that is for r equals 1 exactly what I'm getting. Now it turns out that this is not quite enough and to give you an example, if you give me, if you look at say the, the sum ep, say uh, x plus x p minus 1 uh, over 2 uh, plus 1, well, the corresponding exponential sum which you have here is going to be of the order of p. This is not difficult to see. And, uh, well, I mean, definitely this condition would be satisfied. But what goes wrong is that if you take the difference between the exponents, you get p minus 1 over 2, and that difference is going to be of the order of p. So there has to be another condition there, and the other condition is that uh, if you look at differences, ki minus kj, p minus 1, uh, this thing uh, should be also less than p1 minus epsilon if i is different from j. So uh, it turns out that with these methods from arithmetic combinatorics, this is in fact a theorem. And if you have these conditions, then you can estimate this sum by p at the power 1 minus delta, where delta depends on r and epsilon. And in fact, there is an explicit form for this delta, which allows me to state another problem, uh, which is perhaps easier to do, as it may just involve some kind of reorganization of that type of arguments. The delta r epsilon you're getting is an exponent uh, minus a constant r, something like that, 1 over epsilon plus log r. What you see, nevertheless, although this uh, bound is, I mean, treats basically any given number of monomials, when r is getting reasonably large, uh, the, well, I mean, the, the bound becomes very quickly useless. In other words, if I want to get something useful, uh, what is important is that this delta be at least bigger than 1 over log p. So what you see is that this inequality becomes useless when r becomes as large as log log p. Usually for that kind of thing, you can go up to the logarithm of p. So what is a reasonable thing to try is to get that kind of uh, estimates, well, I mean, with the same method, I believe, uh, for an R which is beyond the double logarithm, say it should be possible to reach uh, the logarithm. Now, um, it turns out that in applications, not exactly the, the ones I was uh, referring to, uh, problems of pseudo random number generators, I forgot to mention also the Diffie Hellman, for instance. The typical application of that kind of, uh, of stuff is when you're studying. Um, what is called the Diffie-Hellman key. Which 
which has to do with the distribution of numbers theta x, theta y. Um, well, you can write it down as fractional parts, so you would have theta x over p, theta y over p, theta x, y over p. So you like to understand the distribution of such things uh, for, uh, well, I mean, uh, you can take x, x and y between 1 and, and the order of theta. You look at it as an element in the three-dimensional cube. You want to say something about uniform distribution. Well, the problem is that if I give you a theta and you let p run, unless you, you have at your disposal things like Artin conjecture or whatever, what you can say is that for most of the values of p, well, I mean, at least for many values of p, you're going to have a multiplicative order of theta. So what is this thing? Well, you can get this thing slightly more than square root of p, unless you make special assumptions, say, whether it's Artin's conjecture or even more. Trouble is that with the known methods, and I'm referring here to Wiles inequality or things like that, uh, this, this square root of p was not sufficient to prove uniform distribution about this system. So here, of course, what? V, V, yeah. No, V, sorry. Uh, so uh, what is, a con as a consequence of that kind of results, basically you get these statements about uniform distribution, uh, no matter what is the order of theta. As long as it's a small power of p, you, you will get it. But for some other applications, and I refer uh, to this, uh, uh, this problem here in coding theory, this thing was nevertheless not enough because this condition about the differences is a quite stringent thing. As I told you, you need to make some assumption, but somehow this, uh, this condition was not exactly uh, the one uh, which is um, suitable for the problem. So I should tell you what is this, basically this decimation uh, question. Well, I mean, this is a problem in coding theory. It has to do with, so, uh, basically what you're considering are systems, I guess I can get a small discount of five minutes, right? You are the boss. I am the boss, okay. Okay, so the next talk is five minutes less. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> um, it looks like he always does what I say. <laughs> Not that they care, but anyway. So we are essentially looking at sequences of zero ones. let's say, infinite sequences with a certain periodicity. So, well, we are considering systems of such sequences that have certain properties, and the property you are, we, we are dealing with here is to have ideal cross-correlations. Now, I'm not really sure I want to define exactly what it is. Uh, systems with ideal cross-correlations. In fact, it will be not only one, si one string and the other string, but also one string and the shifts of the, of the other string. And these cross-correlations are obtained just by taking the corresponding toadic numbers, just by, by taking the sum of ai to y, and then you, you sum up the sequences. And what you want is that in the same sequence, when you look at the distribution of the period of zero ones, it is 50-50. That means ideal cross-correlation. So there is a uh, construction for such sequences that is exactly uh, the one I'm talking about, where you do the following. You take a large prime p, you take a number a integer relative prime to p, and then you do two operations. First, you take the reciprocal. So let's assume that 2 is primitive that, uh, that um, um, uh, 2 is uh, primitive, I guess I have to assume that, uh, mod p. So what you do is that you multiply a with 2, the reciprocal of 2, 1 over 2 at the power i. This is going to give me the i digit. Then you look at this thing, mod p, so you get an integer between 0 and p minus 1. 
And then you do a third operation. You look to get a 0, 1. You look at that thing, mod 2. Then you get 0, 1. So this gives me a sequence A and, uh, of 0, 1s. The problem is, so how do you get the, the full system? Well, what you do is that you look at decimations. So how do you get a decimation? Well, A, I'm going very fast here, right? Uh, D, the i coordinates, it's simply A, D, I, where you assume that D is relative prime with P minus 1. So the conjecture was that for P bigger than 13, that kind of construction leads to a system with perfect cross correlations. Uh, why is that conjectured? Well, for P less than 13, there are counterexamples, and one verified this conjecture up to 2 million. I don't know, 1 million, 2 million, or <laughs> some 2 billion. Billion or million? Billion. Yeah, it's like the budget. Okay, good. <laughs> but it's not quite enough, and uh, not quite enough, at least at this point. So um, this problem, it's, well, essentially what has to be proven, because this was one of the results of goretzky clapper is that really to prove that result, what has to be shown is that uh, different decimations are uh, cyclically, I forgot the name, unequivalent. I have to go a little bit faster, uh, which roughly means equivalent to the following problem. So here we are getting closer to the exponential sums. Uh, in some form, the statement that, so this is the, the new problem here. What I will consider are the even residues, E, 0, 2, up to uh, P minus 1. And I consider the map AX at the power D restricted to E. So what I want to say is that this map AX to the D of E does not map E to itself. I'm dropping a certain number of conditions here, which are partly uh, the conditions which I mentioned earlier. And uh, I have to dismiss also a number of exceptions. So the only exceptions are unless, so what is the assumption here? Well, maybe since I have it, uh, zero less than A less than P over two, and uh, D less than P over two, AD different from 1, of course. And there are still some exceptions, uh, PAD, uh, except, except, except for PAD 5, 3, 3, etc. There are a bunch of them, and then 13, 1, 5. Okay. So, um, now, Basically, the problem is that to prove that, you have to estimate a model sum of the form I described earlier. In fact, with two, with R equals two, uh, uh, with two monomials, which are sums of the form uh, Ax plus Bx at the power um, uh, D say. You, you want to have estimates on that. The trouble being that the common divisor, so if you want to apply the result I mentioned to you earlier, the, the I mean, this is really, okay, forget it. So if you want to apply the, I don't have great experience in teaching as you can see, the great, uh, <laughs> the whatever, the very general statement I wrote you before, uh, the problem is that d minus 1, p minus 1 can be almost of the order of p. That is the problem. So this had several interesting developments. The first is that uh, we kind of tried to understand the weaker problem of solving congruences. This is in a joint uh, paper with uh, Enrico and uh, Konyagin. Uh, beyond the condition that was assumed there, namely that the difference between the exponents have common divides with p minus 1, which is less than p1 minus epsilon. So the development was there that eventually you can still apply this theorem, but before there is some quite interesting mathematics uh, which involves the geometry of Fermat varieties. 
and uh, the, the theory of, uh, say, the, the nevan lina theory. Uh, I mean, it's, it's very close to the, the kind of stuff Voita did around uh, uh, heights in the, um, in, in the, in the, the function uh, setting. So uh, f there are some results there which eventually allow you to prove that this result, this problem, indeed, so we, we could prove eventually uh, a theorem which was strong enough to imply the result which is here, provided p is sufficiently large with some p which is astronomical. Uh, it's certainly not covering the two billion. So then uh, try to look closer and there we are really entering the things which are really of a computation nature with the group in Kansas, uh, realize that eventually it is still possible, at least for part of the job, to use classical methods, in particular variants of Stepanov method for binomials. And, and this is, I mean, something where we did spend quite a bit of time. Eventually the result which we got uh, by analyzing the constants, but we are not only talking about exponents, because this makes sense, but even multiplicative constants, are uh, absolutely essential. So what is known now is that this decimation conjecture is valid, uh, provided, provided, I uh, have to write it somewhere, uh, provided we assume, and ending here, uh, we are uh, supposing P to be bigger Well, you will see uh, p bigger than um, 2.26 uh, 10 at the power 55. <laughs> and that is, and this is, I'll tell you, with methods which are quite good, which are absolutely not only uh, not only uh, uh, explicit, but but give you quite quite good bounds. And with a lot, I mean, there you really have to work a page to, to save some small bit on, on a multiplicative factor because afterwards this there, there is a power of this multiplicative factor which is going to amplify. So this is definitely <laughs> the kind of math which, uh, I mean, most of us are not really doing, but eventually if you really believe, at some point I had the hope that one could perhaps really reach the, the range where one had verified it by, by computer and uh, this was of course my mistake. But in any case, it's trying to, these, these numbers are not random. And trying to improve that would be definitely quite interesting. So I will leave you with that thought and uh, leave the space for the next speaker. Well, it's still good if there are questions to, because the- Oh, that, that's uh, what they should do, the right? Yeah, the, the problem is that it couldn't give you any kind of uh, idea of, of what is some of the mathematics behind. Um,